Welcome to Goulet Q&A number 231. I am Brian Goulet, dressed as Will Ferrell, dressed as Robert Goulet. <laughs> it is, uh, as I'm filming this, it is Halloween and we are all dressed up around the office. By the time you see this, Halloween will be long gone and you'll be like, what is Brian trying to pull here? So, um, I did grow a little bit of a mustache here, like four days worth of stubble and then colored it in with mascara. A nice little trick I learned back in my show choir days in high school. Um, so it's a legit mustache, but it's it's filled in a little bit. Um, but anyway, I can't rub it off. And I've shot, this is my third video I've shot today. And I'm going trick-or-treating tonight with my kids. So here I am stuck shooting a Q&A wearing my Halloween costume. Anyway, I could also pull off a mean Pablo Escobar or maybe a Freddie Mercury or just any like 1970s era cop, you know? So <laughs> I've gotten all these comments on my Instagram. So anyway, I'm having fun today. Enjoying seeing all the team around uh, that you can go back and you can check out our stuff on on the Goulet Gram if you want to. But anyway, Halloween has happened. It's over by now and uh, we're ready for Christmas, apparently, because apparently Christmas started in October when uh, <laughs> as soon as October rolled around, like Target and Home Depot and all them, they're just like, let's just put all the Christmas stuff out. Christmas trees next to, you know, pumpkins and why not? Let's just go for it. Um, anyway, coming up this week, we have midterm elections in the U.S. If you're not in the U.S., you might have some elections going on, but I don't know about them. Uh, but anyway, in the U.S., at least we have elections, so go vote. Um, I uh, think it's important. I don't really care what side you're on, but I think it's important to go and vote if you have that ability to do so. Um, we also have fountain pen day deals going on, which as this video is going out, it is fountain pen day. So you definitely want to check out some of the things we have going on. We put out a special newsletter. You can check our blog, check our website. We got all kinds of crazy deals going on. So be sure to get in on that. And let's see, what else have we done? We've launched our cake and pie retro 51 pens. We alluded to this video last week. So we have these out for you right now. A lot of fun coming up with the video for it and nice fun theme. And it is like neck and neck. I mean like within one or two pens with each other the entire way. So, um, you know, I don't know that we're gonna get a clear answer. We like put a uh, contest on Instagram for it too. Not a contest, a poll on our Instagram story. And it was like over a thousand people entered or submitted and it was like 50 50 so everybody's really split but around our office we're t tilted just a little bit towards the cake side so i'm happy because i'm very much team cake um we also had the retro 51 vino which i realized i didn't even pull out but um it's probably going to be gone by the time this video publishes so we didn't get a whole ton of them but uh you know, apparently it was pretty popular so um more popular than we realized so anyway vino came and went and you know that's about it. Um, Eco Twisby Eco T Clear. Got those in this week, so that's pretty exciting. If you're into the Eco uh, Clear, then you might be interested in the Eco T Clear, because sometimes the Eco Clear could be a little bit in and out of stock for us. Um, but the the T Clear is something that uh, you know could be a nice alternative for you. It's got a slightly more pronounced triangular grip. It's got more of a triangular cap um, as opposed to the hexagonal cap of the Eco. Otherwise, it's really pretty similar. Um, we have the Peniter pen filler. We put out a video on that explaining how to use it. That seems to have gone over really well. Andy and I are trying out some new stuff. Um, specifically with that video, we tried using a teleprompter for the first time, which is like <gasps> scandalous, right? You know, but geez, I've shot 1,450 plus videos, not to count all the live ones too. So probably closer in the neighborhood of 1,800 videos over the last nine years. We're trying a teleprompter uh, and it's really partly part of it's because i cannot memorize for anything like to save my life like i was in a high school musical not like the high school musical way less cool uh, but i was in a high school musical back in my high school and days and i straight up struggled uh to memorize those words it's just not a gift of mine so i can definitely go off the cuff and i can speak like this and i can use bullet points but man, when it comes to memorizing, it's terrible. So we're trying out a couple of videos, just testing it out. We have this cool little like prompter that sits in front of the camera that's made for an iPad and we're trying to sync it all up and stuff. So I don't know, we're trying it out. So if it happened to look a little bit shifty eyed in that video, that might be why, just not practiced yet on that one, but we're trying. Um, we also have the online vision magic, which I don't have any of those with me. Man, I'm grabbing off. There's so much in product wise right now. I'm having a hard time even keeping it all together. But um, anyway, so online vision magic is a new pen that we have in from online. Um, actually, I might have them right over there. Okay, I'll stay in my seat. Um, but anyway, so you can go check that out on the site. It's a pretty interesting pen. It's a metal pen, very shiny, um, you know, 
colorful pen. Yovo nibs on it, writes pretty decent, so it might be something you're interested in. We're not giving it a real hard like push on that, um, but we thought, you know, it could be nice to kind of round out the the online, the online, what am I saying, like models or whatever. Um, so you can check those out. We also have a new color from Noodlers, Purple Mountain Majesties. Um, this was one that they came out with for the Colorado Pen Show, I believe it was, um, and is now going to be available as a regular color. So Sarah's got some of her nice artwork here, um, so you can uh, check these out. It's it's a surprisingly like neutral color, both uh, both color wise and like theme wise. There's there's no dictators on the label. There's there's nothing controversial really. It's very Americana, you know, obviously. Um, you know, kind of um, uh, alludes to the song there, but uh, uh, to America the Beautiful. Uh, but it's uh, it's a pleasant color. It's actually a fairly usable color. So not 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 like extreme properties and stuff like that. So that's kind of cool to see. So you can check that one out. It's not that it's not that far off from our Purple Hearts. Not quite as dark as Purple Heart. Uh, we also have the Bullet Journal Method book. Now this is kind of new for us because we've never really just like straight up carried a book. Like we realize now when we get into book territory that we're competing with Amazon and Barnes and Noble and Walmart and things like that. So, you know, we didn't go real, real heavy on these, but really I wanted to carry these um, just because of our support for Ryder Carroll and for the bullet journaling community. We know that a lot of you are fans or at least have some awareness around bullet journals. Um, so uh, the book is pretty good. Uh, it summarizes a lot of kind of the methodology behind bullet journaling um, and Ryder gets into a lot of his own kind of background and how he developed it and stuff. Even more so, I mean, we did an interview with him two years ago, uh, but he goes even more in depth about like his personal life and how he developed it, uh, which I thought was really cool. So if you're interested in that and want to get kind of a deeper dive, um, and it's more of like a summary, because I mean, you can go and look at blogs and stuff like that. And, you know, Tiny Ray of Sunshine and Kara Benz with Boho Berry. And there's, uh, you know, and of course, Ryder with Bullet Journal. Um, there's lots of different channels, social media channels, where you can get tons of examples of this stuff. But this is the first, I guess, official published book design, designed uh, by Ryder. He designed the cover and all that. So um, we are carrying that now to support Ryder and the bullet journaling community. Uh, and then also we have a couple of new pens that are um, kind of special limited type of nature. So one is the Monteverde Rodeo Drive. So I think they are changing the Rodeo Drive from its like colored bottom and silver top. So we got basically kind of like a clearance batch of them. It's not a pen that we regularly carry. Um, so you're kind of like, why now? Um, because we got a clearance batch of them and we, and we had the opportunity to give you all a deal on them. So we're passing on the deal to you. Um, so you can check those out. These do not have our normal Bach nibs that we would normally have because we're kind of just moving them through. Um, you know, we didn't, uh, we didn't have the opportunity to put these special nibs on them. So they do have the regular Monteverde nibs on them, but I inspected them and they look really good. So um, you can check those out if you're interested and get a good price on them. And then we have another pen that's uh, actually a new pen. It's the Monteverde Regatta Flagship. So it is a carbon fiber and rose gold trim. And we had a rose gold Regatta Sport a couple of years ago that was a limited edition. Um, they made more of them this time. I think a limited edition before was like 99 pens. So there's more of them now and it's all carbon fiber um, components to it with the rose gold trim. It looks pretty sharp. Uh, so you can check that one out if you're interested. Um, and then we also have the Pelican M800 Stone Garden, which came in. And as soon as I saw this pen come through digitally through the computer screen, uh, I looked at it and I was like, oh dang, this is a good looking pen. Uh, so I have it right here and I gotta say, it definitely lives up. And actually, it kind of matches my outfit, funny enough. I never wear this combination. I just bought this from Goodwill last night, but uh, <laughs> this is uh, $3, not bad, right? So this is, uh, the suit was more. Anyway, the <laughs> so it's like a navy blue and then like a navy and kind of like a brownish coppery kind of pattern. And it's it's different. It's not striped like the normal Suvrons are. This one, it actually kind of twists a little bit around the pen. So it's a little more of a diagonal. Um, and the direction of it's kind of different on different pens and stuff like that. But um, very interesting material. I haven't really seen anything like this. Now, I don't know all the vintage Pelican stuff. It could be kind of a throwback to something. I don't really know. But very kind of a classic look to it. Very, uh, And of course, the M800 to me is my favorite, um, uh, my favorite Pelican size. Just fits me well, though I don't have an M1000, so maybe that one would unseat it if I started to get used to that. But I don't want to because 
I have enough pens. Uh, we also have Thanks Giveaway that's starting up. Uh, we've got some details on that on our blog. We're gonna be doing some cool stuff around that, certain giveaways and things like that. I won't get into all the details here, but you can check it on our blog. So um, some fun things like that. We just, we like to try to do something cool to give back a little bit and celebrate writing. Um, so we are gonna be writing some letters to ourselves. We've done various things with Thanks Giveaway for the last five or six years. Um, so we get another little variation of it this year. So be on the lookout for that. And then coming soon, we have so many things, just so many products. And I'm going to unzip this because my neck's itching a little bit. <coughs> we have uh, some things, some Edison pens that we are expanding a little bit into more broad nibs because we're looking at the data and uh, you all are following through on some of the broad action. We're, we're trying to expand broads. You know, Rachel is super into them and behind them and she is um, leading the charge. So we are looking to expand broads as it makes sense for us. So that's one way we're doing it is on some of the Edison pens. Um, we also have developed some custom rickshaw pen cases. Now I'm super pumped about this. I first linked up with Rickshaw um, is a little bit before the San Francisco show. And Rickshaw is based out of San Francisco, so I got to meet uh, Mark Dwight over in, uh, he's the head of Rickshaw, got to meet him. He was, had a booth set up at the show, got to see a bunch of his stuff. We started talking about custom things and it was just like so obvious that we should do something. Um, and you know, we'll have opportunities to do all kinds of stuff in the future, but um, the thing that we're gonna start out with first is these um, pen rolls and pen slips and things like that that um, are themed with our ink and water pictures. So this is the um, actual photography that we did for the ink and water that we have in like our glass doors and conference rooms and stuff inside our building. So we took a lot of that same stuff and put it in these pen rolls. Um, so the we have five different products all together and I'm realizing I'm, oh, here we go. So one, we have a single slip here, and this will fit dang near anything. Like it'll fit a Mont Blanc 149, and it's it's long enough to accommodate even larger pens. Like I've got the um, number eight size nibbed uh, shiny lines from Monograppa, and it fits in here just fine. So it'll fit your larger pens. Smaller ones like a you know Coeco Sport or something might be a little tougher in here. They do make some shorter ones, but we're sticking with this for now. Then there's a double version of it too that has that signature blue. We have this cool thing, this is called a hand roll. Um, and this is actually kind of new from Rickshaw. So they have six different slots in this one and it's just open-ended, there's no flap or anything. So it kind of stays open. The thing I like about this is if you have it rolled up, you can still kind of just work your way in here, grab a pen and pull it out. But it's not like slippery inside of here. They're not gonna like just like fall out just cause you have it in there. The, the, the um, what do they call it? The polyester plush on the inside. Um, Feels really soft, but it does give just a little bit of grab to the pens. And it's kind of like the perfect amount of grab to where like it'll hold it in there, but it's not hard to pull it in and out. So really good good stuff here. They, they source good materials. And then um, of course we have a six, a six pen roll that's got their kind of traditional flap. Um, this is the turquoise one with the turquoise plush. And then there's an eight pen roll as well. And of course there's other options. We can do more custom things, but this is what we're starting out with. Here's the eight, ta-da in the blue. So very blue heavy and I realize that. Um, that's kind of what we're starting out with but uh, let me know what you think of these in the comments and we would love to get some feedback on them. Um, yeah but that's what we're starting out with Rickshaw. So we're pumped about that. Um, we also have the Montegrappa Elmo Verde which is going to be coming out here not right away it's still a few weeks away but um, pretty pumped for that one and I'm realizing I don't have that one handy either do I? I might. Elmo Verde. Let me see if I got it just so I can show you. If you remember, we had the Rosa. That was the red one that looked really nice. Here's the Verde. Really nice, bright green color. Got a decent amount of interest in this so far, so I don't think it's gonna last incredibly long. We had to place the order for these a long time ago before we even um, launched the Rosa. So it's, uh, it's the kind of thing that I'm sure it's, it's not gonna be around as long as we'd hoped, but uh, anyway. Be on the lookout for that. Sign up for it's on the website, so you can sign up for email notification if you're if you're interested in that one. And then what else we got? So the Peniter Snorkel Filler. So that's one that um, it's a little stainless steel tube with a rubber gasket on it, so that you can um, make it easier to fill your cartridge converters. So that's pretty cool. I don't have one physically to show you yet, but I'm sure we'll do a video on that when it comes out. Um, that should be just kind of around the corner. 
Uh, the Visconti Mirage, which Whitney's actually photographing as we speak, so I let her have them, and uh, I'll have to show those to you next week. But we do have some samples of that in the building, at least, and that should be coming relatively soon. Um, the M400, we have an M, a, a Pelican M400 Brown Tortoise. We got some of the nib sizes in, so we're not launching them yet. We're just waiting on some of the other ones, but we were able to, it's not a new launch or anything like that, but basically the U.S. distributor like kind of found some. So we, um, you know, we, we snatched those up. It'll be kind of an assortment of nib sizes, including an italic broad, which is never had an M400 italic broad before. So that's kind of cool. It's basically like a stub, um, but uh, writes really nicely too. I did that for the nib nook, so that's pretty rad. Uh, what else we got? The Pilot Explorer. So I don't have this one to show you either, but I have seen it in person. It's pretty nice. It uses the same uh, nib as like the uh, Pilot Metropolitan. Um, and the Pilot Pereira, so that same format there. Um, but it's a plastic pen, so it's a little bit lighter. If you're not super into like the metal of the Metropolitan, but you like something that's bright and colorful and has that nib, the Explorer might be the ticket for you. So that'll be coming out here soon. We have the Diplomat Arrow in blue in a 14 karat nib. We carry just the stainless right now, but we have gold nibs that are gonna be on the way soon. Um, we have some Lamy gift sets that are in the works. And then we also have another one that's um, from Stipula. This is an exclusive um, that we kind of just got these in and we're going to um, feature these a little bit more, but I can just kind of give you a little sneak peek here as we are getting ready to photograph them and put them up on the site. These we actually ordered like back in February. They've been in development for a while. Um, but anyway, they are the Etruria model, which is a, a larger size model, but not like super, super heavy. Um, it's one of my favorite models in terms of, you know, just the balance of it and the weight and the size of the pen. Um, but it's ebonite. So there's three different ebonite colors. There's a yellow, a purple, and a green, all that have kind of black swirled in there. They're piston filling pens. They have titanium flex nibs on them. And they're limited edition. There's going to be 88 of each of them. Um, and it's going to be kind of a one-shot deal. Once they're gone, they're gone. So... Um, we're pretty excited about those. They've been a long time coming for us. I'm very curious to see how like the ebonite and clear mixture goes because it's very much like this vintage and modern kind of mashed together. So I'm very curious to see what you think of them. Uh, but anyway, you can expect that they'll be out um, pretty soon. So uh, I think that's about it. And there's more, there's more stuff in the works. <laughs> we're just getting warmed up here. Uh, but anyway, hope you've enjoyed all that. All right, and then the last thing I want to cover before I get into the questions is we have these um, Conklin Duraflex Turquoises, which is an exclusive for us. Um, we 1,898 of them. We got like the first shipment of them. The way that it usually works when you're making pens in that quantity is usually it'll kind of come in waves to us uh, because it's hard for them to make everything at once because the chance of delays then um, are really great. And with the holiday season approaching and stuff like that, they wanted to ship it in multiple waves. So um, kind of the first wave that we have um, is probably not gonna last us through the entire holiday season. We've, we've gone ahead and we've ordered the rest of them and they're they're like in the manufacturing process but it's going to take a little bit so we might not actually get replenished until after the holidays so whatever nib sizes that we start to run out of these over the next few weeks uh, won't they will be available again but not until probably after the holidays so just a heads up on that one if you're bound and set to get one of these particular pens for the holidays you should pick it up sooner than later okay anyway sorry not to pressure you but i just wanted to be clear and upfront about that um as we have information. So uh, let's go ahead and get into the questions for this week. Pen and writing questions, starting out with Viking Medic 542 on Twitter. I'm wanting to move towards pens with line variation. However, my handwriting is rather small. As such, I use extra fine or fine nibs. Should I start with a soft fine flex or stub? Okay. So this is interesting because if you're talking about your writing with extra fines, you know, obviously people that um, are coming from like the calligraphy world, they like really, really extra fine nibs because it shows more line variation. So it actually is not a terrible place for you to start, um, but it does, you, with the information that I have from this question, it makes it a little tough to answer um, really because, you know, I don't know. Um, how small your handwriting is exactly. What you say is small could be really small or it could really not be that small, I don't know. Um, but just kind of going off that, you'll probably want to keep your nib a little bit smaller if you're used to writing in an actual very small space. And I'm talking like most of your writing height is somewhere in the four to five millimeter height range 
as opposed to you know your typical college rule paper would be seven millimeters um, or eight millimeters would be considered wide ruled uh, at least if you're kind of growing up in the American school system. So you think about like if you're if your typical wide ruling and you fill those things that's about eight millimeters and if you only fill about half of that that is what I would consider to be pretty small. If you're doing that, going with line variation gets very difficult because basically you're, the, the bigger you go, the bigger the chance you have to show line variation, um, especially on the nib size. You know, that's why they make stubs of different sizes, like Lamy, for example. They're easy to use because they have three different size stubs. So they have a 1.1, a 1.5, and a 1.9. Well, a 1.9 is gonna show a lot more variation than a 1.1 because it's the same line width on the cross stroke for a stub, whereas on the downstroke it's going to be you know varying in width depending on which nib size you actually go with. So with a stub, the bigger the nib size you go, the greater the visual impact of the line variation is going to seem. However, if you're talking about a 1.9 millimeter line and your your height on your words is only four millimeters it's going to look really gross. Like it's going to be almost hard for you, impossible for you to read um, anything. You know, forget if you have something like a pilot parallel that can go up to six millimeters in width. You know, obviously that's a little bit more extreme, but um, it does kind of show an example of, you know, if you want to go stub, you can show more line variation, but you're almost going to be forced to write larger. So if you wanted to go that route, I would say it's not a bad way to go because you can instantly get line variation and it's way easier than writing with a soft nib or a fine nib because you don't have to, or sorry, a soft nib or a flex nib because you basically just write like you normally would. It just, because of the shape of the nib, it happens to look more line variation. So I'm a big fan of stubs as like the first way to introduce line variation into your writing style. It's kind of like fake calligraphy <laughs> or faux calligraphy is a little nicer way to put it. But it's, you know, when I started out writing with fountain pens, first couple of weeks, I stumbled upon a stub nib and I was like, oh, this is my jam because it makes your writing look so much better. Um, just right off the bat, changing nothing else, especially if you're writing in cursive. Um, but anyway, of course, to each their own, right? Um, so the stubs will be a pretty drastic jump. So I would try a cheap one first. You know, maybe get a spare nib if you have a pen that can have a swappable nib or start with something like a Lamy, you know, where you can swap the nibs or, you know, the Goulet number no. six nibs. We sell those. If you have a pen that accommodates a number no. six nib, I have to sneeze then you can use that. <laughs> um, Pilot Metropolitan, you know, you can get uh, a Plumix and you can put that nib on there or some of the Metropolitans have a stub nib you can put on. So there's ways that you can get a reasonable, affordable stub nib, um, more so than probably most flex or soft nibs. Um, so that would probably be the, the easiest way to really kind of test if you like that. Um, stubs will be easiest to use, most accessible, especially with options across different brands and things like that. Um, so that's where I would kind of encourage you to start if you're up for that. Um, Flex is going to write pretty wet. It takes the most practice and it's really kind of hard for small writing. Um, flex pens, if you want to get really decent line variation, you have to write a little bit bigger. So that one is usually a bit of a struggle for people that are used to extra fines, especially because it just puts so much ink down. Um, it's probably going to frustrate you a little bit. So if you were to go the route of trying a flex, I would say go with something that's a little more on the affordable side, like a Noodler's pen. Um, Soft fine would probably actually be the recommendation I would make for what you'll, you might end up being happiest with, depending on how it goes for you. Um, the problem is they're not all that common, these soft fine nibs. You know, you can get them, mostly I've seen on the Japanese brands, you know, especially like Pilot and Platinum. Um, there are some that you can find elsewhere, but those are largely what you're gonna see. And, and the soft nibs, you know, it's really gonna vary. Like Panida is a soft nib too, so that's, I guess, another one that I could, I could throw out there. Um, but most of these pens are gonna be a, a little bit pricier. You're into gold nibs at this point, um, and so you're into the 150 on up price range. So that's that can be a lot for some people just to kind of dabble and experiment, but, you know, as with anything else, if you have the ability to test any of these, either at a pen show or a pen store, or you have, a local pen meetup that you have or a pen pal or something like that and you want to exchange some pens whatever it is you can do that can be a way to kind of test it out a little bit without having to dive in too deep or maybe you just want to go nuts for it and you just really think it's going to work for you um, but usually the soft nibs is not going to give you a great degree of line variation 
you know, it's often just going to feel a little bit softer in your writing. You know, in particular, some of the, the Platinum and, and Peniter ones. You know, the Pilot ones, like the Falcon, is a soft, you know, fine or extra fine. That's when it's going to um, give you a little bit more line variation, you know, but... Um, so that, I think, ultimately, probably you might actually be happy with something like a soft nibbed falcon, uh, but you might try some of these other ones and find something you really like. So that's kind of where I would start, somewhere in those range, somewhere in those three options, and then see where you land. All right, next one is from Versewiz Versewiz on Twitter. After flushing a pen with water, what is the best way to remove all the residual water from the feed to prevent the new ink from being diluted? This is a question that comes up a lot. It was asked several times in various forms in this week's Q&A. So I kind of held, I felt like I had to take it um, just to help explain this a little bit. I've talked about it a little bit before here and there, but I figured why not revisit again? So um, my question to you is, why do you feel you need to get all the water out of there? You know, I know that's one thing that people think is like, I can't have any water in my pen because it's gonna ruin the ink or it's gonna dilute it or it's gonna change it or whatever. The crazy thing is, though, it doesn't actually do it that much. I mean, if yeah, if you leave it like half filled with water, or there's like a bunch of water left in there, or you know, even if you empty out the the body of the pen, but there's you know water filling up the feed, right? And then you like pop a cartridge in, or you fill a converter, and then you put it in without without sucking it up through the pen. Okay, then you'll see it's, it'll look a little more watered down before it works its way through. Um, but the thing is that ink is made up of like 80% water or somewhere thereabouts. So if you're getting just a tiny, tiny little bit of water in there uh, mixed in with your ink, you're not even going to notice it, really. Um, and, if you're and if you're cleaning your pen with, you know, distilled water or if you have, you know, some water that you're using that you know is filtered and is not, you know, some crazy water, then you really don't, shouldn't feel the need to like clean it 100% before you ink it again. I could understand if you want to store it for a long time and you don't want to leave water in there, that's a little different. But in between inkings, when you're just going to reuse the pen, I think you could save yourself so much time and energy by just kind of letting it go and, and not worrying about it that much. And take this from somebody that's used a lot of pens for a bunch of years. You know, what I do when I'm cleaning a pen, you know, here's a good example of a pen because I have a Twisby um, Eco Clear right here and I've inked it up, cleaned it out. I got a couple of water droplets in here. There's one that's kind of hanging around the back. I got some little condensation here, a couple of water droplets here. Then this is a great example because it's not easy to get that kind of stuff out. So if I was really compulsive about wanting to clean this thing out completely, I would have to disassemble the pen, Q-tip swab the whole thing out, probably leave it sitting out for a day or two before it would be completely dry. That gets a little disruptive to like living my lifestyle, right? I just want to ink it up and get a new um, a new color in here. So honestly, what I do when I clean it out, I get it like that. If there's a couple of drops in here like this, I don't sweat it. And I don't know if you can really see that. No, you really can't see that very well. Sorry, I don't have an auto zoom on this camera. Um, but uh, if it gets to be like that, then I don't sweat it at all. I would just ink this back up in a hot second, especially something with this large of an ink capacity. It's like 1.4 mil or something like that. Wouldn't sweat it at all for a little drop it like that. I don't even know how much water that is, but it's really not much. Um, and then all I would do is take a paper towel after I've cleaned it and flushed out as much as I possibly can, maybe shake out whatever water I can get, take a paper towel, put it to the nib and the feed, do it like this for maybe 10 seconds or so in a couple different places. That's going to wick out the water from the feed. That's where most of your extra water is gonna be kind of hanging out in here because the capillary action is gonna make it wanna hang. So you just kind of put it in there. That capillary action is gonna draw it through you know, and then once you feel it and it's not getting your paper towel wet anymore, you're pretty good to go. So a couple little drops in here, really not going to hurt anything in my humble opinion. So I think you could relieve yourself of a lot of frustration and uh, just go for it. And, you know, even with, uh, you know, with most fountain pen ink, if you can actually take and you can dilute fountain pen ink intentionally to extend the life of it or um, to change the properties a little bit. If you want it to write a little bit drier, you can add some water to it. So um, you can dilute it 5%, 10% usually, and not even notice a difference in color. And if you think about how much 10% of the water um, you know, to, to ink ratio actually is, it's way more than would ever be left in here. So if it's just for that reason of diluting it, I think you're good. All right, next question is from Stay Barts on Instagram. I like Monteverde pens very much. I basically started on an Invincia, and even though I have more expensive pens, I still like to use them. I was wondering if you could clarify the process of getting some better or gold nibs on them. I don't see any options for a gold nib by Monteverde. 
what will it fit, and will I have to replace the feed too, or can I just slap it on there? I'd really like some advice if you've got a second to give it. Um, sure, yes, I understand Monteverde hasn't done gold nibs in a while. They have. I actually have one. They did a Monteverde uh, Disney Fantasia. They actually licensed a Fantasia pen with Disney, um, and they have a gold nib on that one. But it's been a few years, so they don't currently have uh, a Monteverde pen with a gold nib on it. Um, but that doesn't mean that you couldn't make it happen. I mean, the thing is about most gold nibs, especially number six gold nibs for some reason, um, they're very cost prohibitive. Like they're, they're surprisingly expensive. So uh, I think the only spare number six gold nib that we have right now is uh, from Edison and it comes in the housing and all that stuff. And it's $150. Um, and even though it's $150, it's not like, man, Goulet's really raking it in. Like, no, we're like scraping by on that pen, on that nib, just to even be able to offer it. Like, I don't even really care if I sell that many of them because as a retailer, we don't really make any money on that nib. Um, maybe a little bit, but not much. Um, so because it's so expensive to start, if we were to really mark it up a lot, it would be so astronomical, it wouldn't even make sense. Even as it is, it's still really expensive. And you know, it's pretty much for like the most hardcore people that really still want it anyway. So we're like, we'll offer it because we don't want to not be able to even give the option, but it's just expensive. So um, that's why you don't see a lot of 14 karat um, or 18 karat uh, number six nibs for whatever reason, they're just expensive. Um, there's not that many people making them. I don't understand. The I mean, the cost of gold has gone up significantly in the last 10 years. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we're at with that. So um, because most of the Monteverdes, not all of them, but most of them, your Invincia especially, um, it takes a number six nib. So you can swap it with another pen that has a number six. Um, you can put a Goulet number six on there if you want to. You can um, you know, put uh, a bunch of other brands if you're interested. And of course, when you're doing this, I got to caveat everything by saying, when you start swapping nibs and pulling parts out of pens, you are totally messing with the warranty and stuff like that. So if you take a nib from a completely other brand, you put it in your pen, if you install it wrong and ruin it or something like that, that's not the manufacturer's deal, right? Like that's on you. Um, and if you are putting it in there, even if you install it correctly and it doesn't perform like you like it to, of course, a manufacturer, a Monteverde is not going to warranty an Edison nib, right? Why would they? It doesn't make any sense. They didn't put that nib on there. So you, of course, understand that you're, you're stepping deep into that. Um, so yeah, um, but uh, one thing I did want to say, if you do use that Edison nib, it does not have the same thread pattern on the housing. So yes, the nib itself could actually be yanked and pulled out of there and swapped. Um, which is a whole other level of, you know, hacking, hackability. Um, you, both of them have removable nib units, but they're from different brands, so they're not compatible. The thread pattern is different, and it won't fit in there. I know, it's like, why, it, why doesn't everybody just make it universal? That would be great. Um, but it's sort of like, you know, why can't you use the same alternator on all of your cars? You know, every manufacturer has their own that they develop, and that's kind of how it goes. It's kind of the same with most pen parts. Um, so the challenge you get into with things like these spare nibs, we've got, and I know I'm focusing on gold nibs here, but the challenge with these is it gets to be so expensive, it's kind of like, well, for $160, I can buy a Lame 2000, or for $144, I can buy a Vanishing Point. So it gets to be the point where it's like, is even practical to do so. So um, that's something you got to keep in mind. You love your Invincia so much that you would pay $150 to put a gold nib on it. I don't know. That's totally up to you, but I can say a lot of people aren't really doing that. Um, a lot of people are swapping out steel nibs and things like that. So they'll put them from other brands, you know, especially if there's like a stub option or something that you can go with, you know, that's pretty, that's, that's pretty common um, for people to want to do that. Um, you know, now there's, uh, you know, like Conklin has their Duraflex nib, the Omniflex. Um, so that's something that people are interested in swapping around. I know people that have shoved, shoved like dip nibs, like Zebra G and, and things like that. And they put that on, <laughs> on their fountain pens too, with some mixed results. Um, but, uh, you know, you can, you can do whatever you want. Uh, it's your pens, you know, but, uh, just kind of understand you're, you're going to get into experimentation, uh, territory here. So clearly I'm very much going to be a proponent of Goulet steel nibs because that's why we developed them was to be able to swap on pens like your 
like your Invincia that take number six nibs um, and to be able to do that. And ours are made by Yovo. You can do an Edison nib. You can do, you know, there's other ones that you can do too. Um, but we like ours and we sell them just as nibs instead of whole nib units because we know people are going to swap them out like that. But Noodler's has spare nibs and there's some other ones out there um, that might fit as well. Um, and we actually have a blog post that we have that's like basically what pens will fit a number six nib or a number five nib. And it's like every of everything we currently carry, what do we know that it'll fit in somewhat reliably? Of course, everything, it could be just a little bit different, but uh, you know, keeping that in mind. Um, Diplomat Arrow could be another option uh, for you too. They have a 14 karat nib option, but again, that's gonna be, that's gonna be pretty pricey. So, I mean, you could, you could get another pen and you could swap the nibs on the two, but again, you're, you're kind of paying a premium. Um, so yeah, I think that about covers what I was going to say. Cool. All right. Anurag chat three RG on Instagram. Forgive me if I butchered your name. Uh, what do I do if my pen starts leaking in an inopportune moment? That never happens. Uh, what are some emergency protocols to prevent ink going everywhere? Wow, emergency protocols. I feel like this is like, should have a fire escape plan or something like that. Um, I've never seriously thought through emergency protocols of an ink leakage situation. I think partly because I just am more of a, let me figure it out in the moment kind of person. <laughs> and part of it is I haven't run into it enough where I felt like I've needed to prepare uh, in such a way that I needed to have protocols in place for such a thing. Um, I've had leaks before. I've gotten stuff on my hands. Probably the most embarrassing one that I had uh, was when I was at a, uh, a conference that I had traveled to for like e-commerce entrepreneurs of sorts. So here we are, like we're all talking about our different businesses. It was like a lunch mingling kind of situation. So we're here and there's like, you know, actually like cloth tablecloth and all this kind of thing. We're outside and Everybody was like, oh, what are you doing? I was like, oh, fountain pens. And I always have a fountain pen on me when I go to these types of networking events because people are like either really confused and they're like, is that the thing with the feather on it? And it's like, no. Uh, or they're like, oh, fountain pen. Yeah, oh, they're really cool. Yeah, do you have one? You know, and so I always make sure to have at least a couple on me um, just so that I can be like, oh, yeah, I do. This, this is a fountain pen. And actually the Eco that I had a second ago, like the Twisby pens are pretty good because they're usually like people get it and they're usually translucent. People can kind of see how they work. You know, they're not crazy expensive. If you pull out and you're like, oh yeah, I have an $800 pen. They're like, what? And they just don't even understand. But if you're like, oh yeah, this pen's, you know, $28. That's like, oh, okay. That's okay. I can understand that. Um, but anyway, so I'll pull out a pen like this. So I had one, I think it was a, uh, I want to say it was an Eco T or uh, something like that. And uh, what had happened was, I, f I forget what it was. I'd given the pen to somebody else and they were messing with the mechanism and something had happened where I hadn't tightened down um, the, the threads on the, the piston mechanism enough. And so when, when somebody was messing with it before me, it had actually loosened up the piston mechanism a little bit. So as I pull the pen out, and I'm a fiddler anyway, I was kind of showing everybody like, oh, this is kind of how it works. And I was like, you know, you, you do this mechanism to move the piston. And as I did that, it like started to unscrew the piston out of the back. And I was like, oh, shoot. And I was like, uh, okay. And so as I was like fumbling with it, I ended up squirting ink all over to my hands. I got it all over the tablecloth. It was blue ink, thankfully, so at least it didn't look like, you know, I'd hurt myself or something. Um, but I totally did it, and it was in front of like eight other people, and they were like, "So this is uh, this is fountain pens, huh?" But I mean, uh, basically, what I did is is I, uh, I I I view it as as kind of a risk of a hobby, right? Like it's possible that you could get a leak. It's going to happen if you are deathly afraid of ever getting ink on your hands or having a leak. Really think twice about <laughs> whether this is the hobby for you, because it's just. It's just a risk, you know? It's sort of like if you buy a high performance car, you know, you're gonna burn out your tires and you're gonna need to replace certain parts if you drive it hard, you know? It's like, it's part of the nature of using the tool as it was intended to use. Um, so, uh, you know, you might get a leak here and there. So if it makes it help for you to, to kind of come up with a plan, that's fine. But for me personally, what I usually do, and, and granted, I'm in a different situation because most of my time I'm in my office uh, where we're used to fountain pens all day long. So I keep uh, actually a roll of paper towels like right over here and I use paper towels all the time. Tissues can work really well too. Um, so tissues are usually a little more handy than paper towels in most office situations. But you can carry a pack of travel tissues or something like that if that helps. <coughs> and you can 
um, just kind of have that at the ready so that if you do get a leak, you're like, oh gosh, if I get a leak and it's not like completely tragic, like dripping off my hands, if it just kind of like leaks, you know, sometimes it'll happen. It'll be hot outside. I'll come in. There'll be a little bit of burping that'll happen. It'll get on the grip. As I unscrew it and go to use it, I get ink on my fingers. It happens sometimes. Usually what I try to do in the moment is rub it in a little bit just so it doesn't, it's not like wet and pooling on my fingers. It kind of makes the color look a little worse, but at least then it's not, you know, if I have paper, I can like rub it on the paper. Um, but if I have nothing near me that I can absorb it up, I'll just rub it into my fingers a little bit. And then I, when I go to the bathroom, I can wash it off. Um, but if I had something like that, you know, rub it in or, you know, pull out a uh, tissue or something like that, wipe it off as much as I can. Um, and the thing that I found is that, uh, it's perfectly okay to excuse yourself if you get a little ink on your fingers, as long as you're not like leading a presentation or something like that, and it would completely halt the meeting. You can just excuse yourself for like one minute and be like, oh, excuse me, I got some ink on my fingers. I want to go wash them. That seems like a pretty reasonable uh, request for most people to make. You know, and I like to say that it's, it's best just to kind of make light of it. If you're like super embarrassed and just, oh my gosh, and like you really show that on your face, everybody else is going to be kind of awkward and embarrassed for you, you know, just in general. It's like if anything happens, if you spill food on yourself or you spill coffee or something like that, if you kind of laugh it off and, and just kind of own up to it a little bit, that's always going to be a better path, in my mind at least, um, than trying to like hide and make like it didn't happen and be really ashamed of it. Look, it's just simple stuff. It's Stuff happens, whether it's a pen or food or whatever, you know, stuff happens sometimes and it can be a little bit embarrassing in the moment, but, um, you know, the thing that I always like to do is come up with just kind of like a, a witty little thing to say, you know, it's like, oh good, well I need to go to the bathroom anyway, so uh, I'll be right back, <laughs> you know, something like that. Or, you know, oh, doesn't this color look good on me? I just, you know, I felt like my hands needed some little color today. Um, you know, or you could say, yeah, I saw you eyeing my pen. I just wanted to make sure that you didn't actually want to take it. <laughs> you know, something like that. Go, go, uh, go lighthearted with it. Um, and I find that that's probably going to be the uh, the best way to go. Um, if you do actually end up spilling ink or something and it gets on like paper is always a, a good route to go. So if you have a paper, as long as it's not like something critical and like irreplaceable, you know, and you see that like, oh gosh, I've drifted everywhere. Let me go ahead and just kind of move my hands over here where there's some paper while I assess what's going on instead of like right here in the middle of this wood desk, you know. Um, so always try to divert yourself over to paper or something where you can kind of soak it up. Um, when in doubt, you know, tilt the pen up if you see, unless the pen's like leaking out of the back, wherever it's leaking from, if you can tell, usually it's going to be leaking from the nib end. So do that and then kind of keep the pen nib up because if there is some kind of like leaking burping kind of situation going on, having the nib down is going to probably increase the likelihood of it dripping more. So point it nib up or set it down on paper or something like that so that it doesn't, uh, uh, leak all over the table or whatever it is. Um, and then I would say if you know that you're going to be going to a really important meeting, maybe choose a pen that you know is a little more reliable. Don't go with an eyedropper, no flex, nothing that's too crazy. Um, just kind of go a little more conservative with your nib choice. Um, you know, something with a hooded nib that is less likely to leak maybe or something like that. You know, just a pen that you know is much more reliable. Um, and then it never hurts to have a backup pen. You know, if you go into a leak situation, you're like, I just don't even want to deal with this pen right now. You can set it aside. You can pull out another pen um, and that would be perfectly fine. So I guess that's, that's about as much as I could come up with is what to prepare. That's more than I do to prepare in any given situation, except for like the most important critical of things like when I'm traveling or something like that. But if you, if you go buy some of this stuff, you should be in really good shape. All right, next we have a question from Adrian Geth on Instagram. How come we don't see many pens offered with a number eight size nib? I see mainly number five and number six. Well, I'm gonna have to speculate a little bit on this question because I have not actually had a lot of conversations with manufacturers specifically about the shortage of pens with number eight nibs. Um, so, you know, forgive me for just pontificating a little bit, but that's just where I'm at on this question. So, um, you know, the most recent ex Excuse me. Most recent example I have of a pen with a number eight nib is our Montegrappa Shiny Lines Dove. Uh, this pen in particular has a number eight. It doesn't necessarily look as huge as some pens with number eight nibs do because it's it's kind of shoved down in the pen a little bit. But I've seen other ones like the Delta Dolce Vita Oversize. Montegrappa's done a couple different ones with number eights. In fact, they're probably the ones that I can see that have number eights available a little bit more. Um, there are other brands that have larger nibs like this. I'm thinking like Namiki has larger nibs. Pelican with their M1000 has larger nibs, but the whole number eight, like that's a more universal size. Like you see Pilot and, Plat and Platinum and Sailor, they all have their own kind of proprietary nib size thing going on. Um, 
the number eight one and number six and number five and all that is somewhat of a more universal size. Um, so you'll see this on a few different brands. I think the reason, if I had to say, probably the most practical reasons why you're not seeing them is because it's a pretty large nib. Like it's, it's gonna be, um, you're gonna have to really design the pen around the size of this nib. The wings are a little bit wider, the nib is gonna be a little bit longer, so you can't go but so thin on a pen like this. In fact, as I'm looking at the shiny lines here, um, this is about as thin of a grip as you can go with a pen of this size. And this is about as thin of a cap as you can go, and it's a pretty good size pen. So you just really are more limited to larger size pens, which means not only is the, the size gonna be bigger, it's gonna be a little bit heavier, it's gonna be more expensive because you're using more material, um, the nib itself is gonna be bigger, it's gonna use more material, you know, gold in this case. So everything is gonna be priced a little higher, which means that it's gonna be, you know, demand is gonna be a little bit less. So I think it all kind of fits in there. I don't know if it's like a supply issue of just there's not a lot of companies that make them. That could very well be the case. Um, and it also could just be that the price tends to be a little bit higher, so demand for them is not as great um, as it would be for other ones. Like, I can't name you a pen that has a number eight nib that is less than $800 off the top of my head. I really, I can't think of one. So you're into pretty expensive pens here, which are gonna have their own kind of niche anyway. You know, it'd be pretty cool to see pens that had number eights that were steel, that were on more affordable pens. That'd be pretty rad. Uh, I don't know that that is in the works with anybody though, but you know, I'm kind of interested. I think you piqued my curiosity here. And it was just one of those things where I'm like, you know, I've been in this industry for a while and I would just, I haven't, haven't had a lot of awareness around these number eight size nibs, I think because I just haven't seen them available in a lot of pens, um, especially because I didn't always carry pens in that like $800 and up price range. That's a relatively, within the last two years or so, three years really, um, that's a relatively new thing for our company's history. So it's not something that I've been having active conversations with every manufacturer, but you know, maybe I will start to ask about it a little bit more, just kind of see what our options are. So I appreciate you asking the question because now it's not me get, got me thinking, huh, I wonder if we can make that happen. That'd be kind of cool. All right, next question I have is from Manulo on Twitter. Is it dangerous to handle pens with creamy or moist hands? lotions, creams, sweat, etc. What would be some hints on that other than gloves? <laughs> don't wear gloves. <laughs> Fountain pens are weird enough to most people. You don't need to be wearing gloves everywhere and then blame it on your pens. No, um, some people have really dry or sweaty hands. So any pen, recommended pen for that. Um, you know, I fit more into that sweaty, oily hand category. I don't deal as much with lotions and creams, even in the wintertime, because my hands are so oily. Um, so I'm more on the like hand oils affecting my pens and sweat and stuff like that than I am the other side of the lotions and creams. I feel like that's more if you have dry hands. Um, so either way though, you know, dangerous to handle these pens, that's probably a more intense word than I would use, quite honestly. Um, so I would say no, it's, it's not dangerous, uh, really. There might be some natural materials that are out there that are more susceptible to um, lotions or creams and, and maybe even hand oils, things like wood, maybe ebonite, uh, leather, casein, maybe some celluloids, certain metals, like if you have copper or a sterling silver or something like that, maybe there could be a tarnishing uh, effect that some of these lotions and stuff could have. Um, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't really heard of like a lot of specific incidences of people that have had, you know, lotions and creams and stuff. And it's like, actually affected their pens. You know, it might make it a little slicker, you know, so if you have a pen with like a metal grip and you have very lotiony or very oily hands, it could make it a little harder to hold on to. Um, but I haven't heard of it. So maybe like the slightly increased risk of the fact it could slip out of your hand, maybe then it could be considered dangerous. Um, but I haven't really like heard of that being a pervasive thing. Um, it might just be like your own. If you know you're a naturally clumsy person, you have a really heavy pen with a metal grip and you'd like to really slather on the hand lotion, maybe just think about that. If you're gonna be going, you know, outdoors and writing in a parking lot or something like that. And if you drop your pen, it could be very detrimental. So maybe just pick a different pen, you know? So it's these types of things like maybe you should consider, but there's nothing that's like, oh yeah, hand oils kill pens. Not really. Um, it might affect some of the tarnish or patina on certain materials, but um, it's really not 
anything too crazy. So I don't think it's something you need to overthink too much. Just maybe have some general awareness around it and I think you'll be just fine. So all in all, I would say just do you and you don't have to sweat it. You like that. All right, I'm gonna close out this week with a personal question. This was actually lumped in with Adrian Getz's other question and I broke it out into a separate one because it was a completely off topic one. So I made it my personal question for the week. Um, so Adrian Getz from Instagram asked also, is cereal soup? So, uh, you know, we're all into hypotheticals around here at Goulet. That's where the whole cake and pie thing came from. That came up like five or six years ago. Um, it was a hypothetical. I can't remember if Drew came up with it or who it was at the time, but it caught on like wildfire. There's all kinds of other hypotheticals that have come up here. You know, cake donuts versus yeast donuts. Is a hot dog a sandwich? all these types of things, waffle versus uh, pancakes, all this type of stuff has just been like, boom, uh, you know, just absolute flint for the bonfire of, you know, versus type conversations. So um, is cereal soup, this just, I guess it's because we launched Cake and Pie this week, it just struck me in such a way where I was like, I've never thought about that before. And I think when this question came in, it started to have a little scuttlebutt from the team because as I had my door open, I kind of listened and I heard a little bit, bit of debate about it. And I was like, what is this all about? And I kind of locked it away. And then as I saw this question come up later that day, uh, when I was reviewing questions to choose for um, Q&A, I was like, oh, this is what everybody was talking about. I was like, let me do a little research. So I just kind of like Googled like, is cereal soup? And there's some debate about it, a little less heated debate than like cake versus pie and like these types of things. Um, but the debate or the hot dog is a hot dog a sandwich and all this type of things. Um, but uh, apparently there's some debate across the internet. So I tried to educate myself a little bit. I spent about 10 minutes and no more uh, before I realized that sleep was really more important <laughs> because I usually prepare Q and A like late Tuesday nights um, once uh, the kids and often Rachel have already gone to bed. So uh, I'll go ahead and make a little bit of an argument for both sides and I'll state my stance. So uh, apparently according to internet research, um, the argument for those that say yes, cereal is soup is that it's comprised of things in liquid, uh, just like soup. Um, the argument against it is that no, it hasn't like structurally been altered or cooked together in any way. And that cereal exists as cereal without or with or without milk. So, but yet there is no soup that is soup apart from its base. There's no soup tree where you can get soup that grows on trees and these, these type things, that it has to be comprised of other things. Um, the, I looked up the dictionary's definition of soup uh, and it's based much more on like a broth, meat and vegetable base, uh, not really grains and milk and stuff like that. And then it tends to be more like in the savory camp as opposed to sweet, which is usually where you know, your milk is with things like dairy and, and grains and sugars. Um, so yes, you can make an argument for cereal being a soup. If you really take every single one of these points kind of onto the fringes, you can be like, well, there's a sweet and sour soup. What about that? Or, you know, a lot of people say like, well, soups are primarily hot and cereal is not hot. And then people are like, what about oatmeal? Where does that fall? Or, you know, what about gazpacho or a soup that's served cold? Yes. Okay. There's examples here that get on the fringes where you can then draw the conclusion. But like, I think that the main argument is like, the spirit of what they are or like the main intention of what they are is really quite separate. So um, I'll make the statement that I say, well, technically, I think you could stretch to say that yes, cereal could in some way be considered soup. But I ask the bigger question, why? I'm a huge fan of cereal. I loved cereal growing up as a kid. In fact, I would eat such massive amounts of cereal, I can't even comprehend it now. And now that my son is approaching nine years old, I'm like, oh my gosh, he's gonna get to that point where he's gonna start eating inconceivable amounts of food. He's still not quite there yet, but my daughter's actually, my daughter's almost seven and she's the one that's the big eater. Uh, but anyway, so, uh, you know, I remember back to my childhood and I'm like, holy cow. Uh, one of the most memorable uh, sit-down uh, events that I had with cereal. I mean, I would eat two or three bowls of cereal coming home from school. Two or three full bowls of cereal. You know, I'm like a big cereal bowl. Two or three of those and then have dinner like an hour, an hour and a half later. And like think nothing of it. I mean, that's what I would do like every day. I'd come home from school and, and eat that much cereal. I loved cereal. 
and more of the plain stuff. I'm not talking like Lucky Charms and Fruity Pebbles and that kind of stuff. That's like too much sugar. I would eat like, you know, Cheerios and Corn Flakes and these types of things. Still a lot of sugar, I know, but um, much more of the plain cereals. You can't eat three bowls of Fruity Pebbles every day. That's just, ugh. Anyway, so, um, you know, for me, I would say to summarize this whole argument to this very silly conversation, uh, I would say that why try to make cereal into soup? Let soup be soup and let cereal be cereal. Cereal is great for what it is, and I don't want to try to make cereal fit into any other category. I think cereal stands alone as its own food category, and that is my stance. So I would say, technically, I would say you could argue it's a soup, but I would not call it a soup, and I think that it devalues what cereal is for itself by trying to call it anything else. Let it be cereal. All right, my question of the week this week, because I'm just mentally tapped out <laughs> after this very busy day today, is just to flip this one around on you and say, do you think that cereal is soup or is this just a crazy argument? Um, my writing prompt for this week, you know, being that we have the US midterm elections coming up here. Um, if you are in the US, uh, I would like for you to write out the preamble to the constitution. I don't even know if you know what the preamble is or if you've thought about it like ever. Um, I meant to look this up. I, I had to memorize the preamble um, because my eighth grade civics teacher um, was really set on trying to put the Constitution on the back of the $1 bill. And in fact, um, we made some decent headway. We got a senator to propose it and uh, he had been trying for like years. Um, the year that I was there in school, we got um, a senator to propose it. It got shot down, of course. Um, and Saturday Night Live actually did a weekend update segment on it um, that somehow referenced something that was somewhat inappropriate about like, you know, when you're getting a lap dance, you can, you know, learn about the constitution or something like that. It was wildly inappropriate joke, but we were like, hey, we're famous. Um, but anyway, uh, so uh, I think it would be really cool, you know, uh, just in the spirit of voting and all that stuff, just write out the preamble. It won't take you too long. Or if you're not in the US, um, just write out some portion like the intro portion to your own constitution or some other meaningful document that you may have for your country um, if you feel in a patriotic kind of spirit. And then I thought about like, oh my gosh, I can't memorize for anything, but I remember we had to memorize the preamble and uh, I wanted to see if I could still do it. I meant to look it up again last night because it's like, I'm not joking, I have not looked at it in probably 15 years. Um, so I was gonna see how hardcore it's locked in there. So we the people of the United States, in order to form, or more, per, to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the, for the common defense, promote domestic tranquility, and secure the, oh gosh. And this is where I get lost. <laughs> Provide for the common defense, promote domestic tranquility, and secure uh, something to ourselves and our posterity to ordain and establish this constitution of the United States of America. I missed something in the middle there. I missed something, what it, I gotta look it up. I'm sorry, just hang with me for a hot second. Preamble, the preamble, US preamble. By the way, it's like the intro paragraph. We the people of the United States are for our parenting establishment and ensure domestic tranquility, provide the common defense, Promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Do ordain and establish this constitution of the United States of America. If I had looked that up for like five seconds last night, I would have been able to recite the whole thing. Hot darn. Oh well. I still think I did okay. So anyway, if you can write the preamble by memory, then you get bonus points from Brian. Anyway, <laughs> if you're looking for a reason to write with your pen and ink, go ahead and do that. Write the preamble and that would be pretty cool. Otherwise, just have a fantastic weekend. Have a great fountain pen day. Hope you enjoyed yourself. Very entertaining week this week. Um, I will see you all next week. Thanks so much for watching and right on.